Hello, my dear students. Hope you're well and keeping safe. Uh, my name is Omadu Jen. I'll be taking you through uh, our units, the theories and models of mass communication, DJL 2209. Welcome. And to start, we just do the introduction. We get to know what communication really is, because this is something we do every day, in our everyday life. Like we, uh, we will see human beings are social beings who will never be able to live without communicating to or with each other. And so the word communication is derived from our Latin word communis, which means common, to share, exchange, send, transmit, write, relate, and then this, all this now be, uh, comes to communication. One thing, my dear students, I want you to realize is that for you to communicate, to have these common accept, uh, aspects of communication, we need to come from a, a certain field of exp experience, such that whatever you're communicating is something I can be able to understand and something that uh, you can also be able to understand so that we can be able to, comp uh, to proceed with the communication we want. And... Uh, we also note that communication is a learned skill. Communication, and especially when a child is born, we are born of, with empty slates. That means that in our mind, there's nothing. So how come then later, even like when we watch our children grow, our brothers and sisters, we see them try to imitate some certain words? It is because these slates, this empty mind, is later learned, I mean, filled with the information that comes from either the parents, the siblings, and then later within the people within the environment. And however, one th another thing, while most people are born with physical ability to talk, not all communicate well unless we make special efforts to develop and uh, refine this skill further. Yes, we are born and we learn this skill. Some people are more talented, like we, when we look at journalism, those people who do public speaking, they are born with uh, that ability to speak. But we still have to undergo a certain training, a certain course, so that we can enhance the skill we have. And through that, we can learn the rules uh, in communication. We can learn what to say when, how, and even where. So we have to learn more about communication. Then the ability to uh, communicate effectively at work, home, and in life is one of the most important skills a person needs. Remember, the moment you're, you're born, you grow, you'll step out and you need to socialize with other people. From your family, you will go to, could be a school. This child, once this child grows up, they'll be taken to baby class. They will have to communicate with other people. Then later as they advance, they will continue to uh, interact with other people. The church could be, for instance, uh, media. Then we have even the politics within the country based on the, uh, the age and again the interest they have. Thus, we require to obtain certain skills. And such skills we need is like one, negotiating skills, uh, socializing skills, meeting skills. When you talk of negotiation, uh, nego you need to negotiate with other people on behalf of other people. Like, for instance, at times you will be a representative somewhere, and you're the one who is put there to go and represent other people. So, and there are things that you're discussing. Who is going to take that responsibility? It is that one person who has the skills, the one person who will be the advocate. So you do the advocacy roles. And then you need to socialize. Remember, we've said that uh, people or human beings, they are social beings. So which means that we can't just be able to live a life of our own. That is why every day we wake up in the morning and the first thing you'll do when you meet with someone is to say hi. And like, for instance, when you're traveling, thanks be to COVID-19, nowadays we don't have uh, to stay close to people. But once in a while you get into a matatu and you, you, you sit next to a stranger, someone you've never seen, but that person will pick up on a, con a conversation. Why? Because we are social beings. And then we still have to go for meetings. These meetings, remember, meetings, it's about mutual understanding and agreement. You give me your points and I give you my points and then we meet somewhere at the center, the middle, and then we are able to communicate. Then how do you know even the rules? 
When do you know when to communicate and who to communicate with? How do you know about the tone? You're going to use the tone variation. How do you even know how to use the nonverbals when you're communicating? Because remember, when you're using the verbal and nonverbal communication, they complement or they can either supplement each other. So how do you tell when you're supposed to do, be doing something? Then uh, con communication, just like what I've highlighted, is both verbal and nonverbal. When it's verbal, it's when it's spoken. When, like what I'm doing now, I'm speaking, and that is verbal communication. And then nonverbal, it is now use of gestures, the way we dress, hardships, okay? The way, the distance we have between one person and the other. In terms of time, you also communicate. There are those people who are so poor when it comes to time. You agree with pa a person you're supposed to meet at around 12, but they come at 3. That dis uh, communicates something to the person awaiting. And then, nonverbal inter uh, interaction between a young child and the family is very fundamental. I, I keep asking my students every time I'm teaching. We've come from a, a, a family. And every family has its own rules, the way you communicate. You have a father, a mother, or could be your guardians, okay? The way you communicate to your parents, the way they communicate to you is different with the way you communicate to the other people, the, your age mates, your siblings. Like I used to see, my mother didn't have to like whip anyone, like when there were guests. She really didn't have to tell you, don't come into this house when they are guests. Don't speak when someone else is speaking. Just the I itself and you knew, interpreted that. And if like you're peeping because the guest is having a meat, the, the next thing you will do when your mother looks at you, you'll just run and hide and pray that your mother doesn't beat you. That is why even within the family, you find children will communicate with their, their uh, parents using the nonverbal, the I itself. At times, the, the parent can just point at you and then you interpret that. That is all about the concept of uh, communication. Then, uh, one other thing that I, I want you to remember is that speech and language are two tools that we use to communicate with each other. Share thoughts, ideas, and emotions. Look at what I'm doing. I'm talking to you. And... The language I'm using, it should be a language that you relate with, a language that you're able to understand. Remember, we live in a certain culture. Like, for instance, when you're students, our culture, our learning culture, how then do we learn? We learn through language. Language is the one tool that is used to transport the culture we do. My dear students, when you look at culture, don't look at the traditions only. Culture is a people's way of life. Every day, thing that we do every day. That is our culture, our learning culture. Religion is our culture, you know, all that. And these things are learned by people, and we use the language. I remember one time I was reading somewhere, and I saw a quote. You speak with a language um, I know, and you steal my thoughts. But the moment you speak with a language I, I, I understand, my language, you steal my heart. That is how powerful language is in communication. Then uh, also on terms of ideas, how can we share our ideas, our thoughts, if I don't understand what you're telling me? How do you understand my emotions? Remember, emotions I don't have to come and tell you I'm feeling so sad. My facial expression will communicate to you before I even say. I saw someone saying mothers are the most beautiful uh, people on that. You will ask a mother, a mother is crying and a baby asks the mother, are you crying? And the mother will say, no, I'm fine. But what about the nonverbal? The child has seen the tears. So every time we are using these verbal and nonverbal, they should always complement each other. Don't use them uh, against each other. We communicate to share our feelings, ideas, opinions with others. This can be intellectual, personal, spoken, or written in nature. Communication can also be uh, through oral communication, like what we are doing now. It can also be written, like when we write uh, letters, when we write emails. That is also a form of communication because we are sending that to someone else. And then we live in groups and man is 
uh, a social animal. That is what I started with. We are social beings. So we can't be able to do away with communication. We really need to talk to each other. We need to share our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptions, our fears. Like during this moment, when we don't even know what future holds, we don't even know how tomorrow will be. Every time when we wake up in the morning, the first thing will be, how many cases were there yesterday? How many cases are, will be there today? You know, this a lot of fear and we need to communicate with someone if we don't do that then it means we go we sink into depression then i'll be able to share my emotions how i feel my fears you know my expectations these ones i can only tell you i can you can't be able to see them from the emotions even though you can read them through the nonverbal. i have to speak to you and tell you exactly how i feel then communication is a two-way process where sender and receiver exchange roles. However, my dear students, communication can be one way, which is authoritative. And this authoritative communication is when you're directing, giving orders to someone, uh, when uh, you have a boss somewhere and somebody at the boss. And at times we find even in families, this is what people will do. I will come and give orders to the children. And it remains at that. But communication is also a two-way communication. We will see as we look at the theories and models in communication. We will see in models this linear communication whereby information comes from the sender all the way to the... Uh, he comes with a, up with a message through a channel to the receiver and then this impact or effect. That is lean, linear, a straight line. But again... There is a time when uh, now communication will stop to be linear because now we're becoming scholars, we'll interact more with books and see communication, I don't just give orders to someone and that person keeps quiet. No, these are response. And that is now when communication becomes a two-way process where the sender and the receiver will exchange roles. We will see as we proceed, somebody calls Osgood and Shram. They say that communication is transactional. It is a process where the sender will encode the message, send that message to uh, via a channel to the receiver, and receiver will gi give respond. So even as this communication is continuing, it will not stop with the receiver because at this moment, the feedback will be given. And this feedback will change now what we are saying here. The sender and the receiver exchange roles, these roles switching whereby the receiver will now again become the sender and the sender will be waiting for the message to receive the message. So what are the roles of communication? Remember we are doing theories and models of communication. So we really need to understand the concepts of our communication. One, uh, we can use communication to motivate people. We can use communication to inform. Uh, we can also use communication to suggest the way forward. Like, for instance, during this moment, again, we use the COVID-19 as an example. We are waiting for suggestions. Like the other day, I had uh, the CS of education say, uh, we, will, we are still discussing on how on a get back to class plan. So we are waiting for suggestions on what we need to do. How many masks do we want do we need in our school so that we can have our classes back to normal? How many sanitizers, you know, the distance in terms of, uh, for instance, the spacing, social spacing. How do we go about it? So we need suggestions. Then uh, it wants, for instance, we all know there are areas that are very uh, risky. So it is the work of communication, the communicator to tell us the areas that we can't go and the areas that we can go. And then they'll also tell us what to expect. And like every time we hear media telling us about uh, there's a planned attack in a certain area, so don't visit that place. And it is so happy. So we got a warning from media through the communicator. Okay. Then... Uh, communication orders, this is going, uh, giving rules, this is what we say, the one way uh, form of communication, the authoritative way. I will come and command you, I, I tell you to do something and I don't expect you to, uh, to give me feedback. You're, this, it is your duty to do that and you have to do that. And then it changes behavior 
every time that we need uh, to change a certain behavior, a certain practice. Like for instance, um, the government and uh, the Ministry of Health have been campaigning against FGM. Why? Because of the consequences, the fistula. What do they do? They use communication for social change, to change this behavior for people to stop uh, practicing FGM so that we can avoid having women who are suffering from fistula. Wife inheritance is another thing, another campaign that takes place within the government and the Ministry of Health. Why? It has its uh, cons. So what do they do? They use the same communication to bring this information to the people so that people can be able to understand where they're coming from. And then it establishes better relationships to make interaction meaningful and oneself understood. How else do I understand you if you don't communicate? How do I tell what you're going through if you don't tell me? That is so, so those are some of the questions we keep asking. I did A because she didn't tell me she was going through one, two, three. But if she had told me prior, then I could have done things differently. So every time we communicate, there's better relationship. I hear people say in marriage, marriage is all about our relationships, friendship. And they say the key thing that will keep a marriage together, it's good communication. Look at organization. Why do they stand? Organizations will start because of good communication. So we keep saying that communication equals organization and equals friendship. We can't have these people to interact with if we don't communicate to, with each other. Then we have the communication process. Now that we know what communication somehow con entails, now we need to know the process itself. And various uh, scholars will define communication differently. One, it can be the information transmitted, information passed from one person to the other. Okay, then it can be either a verbal or nonverbal messages shared amongst each other. Uh, and then it's a process by which information is exchanged between individuals through common system of symbols, signs, and behavior. Now, I emphasize on the third point. This information, I talked of the common field of experience. When we are communicating, we must come from something we understand, all, all of us. Like for instance, right now we are doing theories and models of communication. I am your teacher, you are my students. We must have a common field of experience, whereby some of the terms I'm, I'm mentioning, you are able to relate with them. And that is why we are doing the introduction, even before we introduce the theories and the models. Because we need to know when I talk about A and B, this is what, in this context, this is what exactly it means. So we need to have that uh, exchange between people and we must have common systems, the symbol we use. I, I'll ask a very simple question. Imagine someone came into cl uh, to class. I came to class one day and I'm holding a bottle of juice, but in that, on the bottle there's a, a symbol, a skull and the X and it's in red. I'm so sure most of you, even though you can see it's juice, and I'm telling you, I'm giving you a confirmation that it's juice, you will still not take that because the symbol speaks differently. So we should be able to understand even the symbols people use. Like every time when crossing, uh, we are crossing roads, we see children and there's a bump. So we are able to read those symbols and uh, interpret them. So communication doesn't have to be spoken. It doesn't have to be written, even through the symbols we use. And then the signs and then the behavior. At times I'll come to class. The way I'll carry myself, I find students coming to class, they have their own issues, so the teacher try, uh, tries reaching out, talking to them, but the attitude is just too negative, huh, if I may quantify. Why? Because there's that certain behavior, and that is now what that student is using to communicate. The way you carry yourself speaks louder than uh, the spoken words. Then uh, other scholars will say communication is negotiation of shared meaning. Then communication is the process of sharing our ideas, thoughts, feelings, other people's having their, those ideas, thoughts, feelings understood by the people we are talking with. That is what we've been discussing. It's all about I understanding your ideas and you understanding my ideas, what I have in my uh, mind, the, uh, the perceptions I do, I have, 
my beliefs so that you can be able to communicate with me effectively. Uh, the next thing we will look at this, the element of this communication we are discussing. What makes communication? One thing is that we need to realize is that communication is a process. It takes different steps. And these steps, they are interdependent. Every step of communication, every element of communication depends on the previous one. One, we have the source or the sender. This is the person who encodes information, the person who comes up with message. And every time we are coming up with these messages as senders, we need to have the receiver in mind. We need to know how this uh, message, the perception, the way that it will be received by the receiver. So when you are constructing message, always have the receiver in your mind then the message which is simply the content to be disseminated the message you want to pass to the other person that is the content that is the message and then we have the channel or the medium these are the platforms we use to pass this information and like we will see uh, we have different types of platform or the medium and even right now the medium between you and me is air we have uh, like in a class setup. Right now, this, what we, will, we are doing, the platform will be media. So we can have television, we can have uh, radio, we can have newspaper, we can have brochures, all those internet, those are channels of communication. And then we have the, the receiver. The receiver is the person, the target audience, the person to whom the message is intended to get to. The person who will get this message is the receiver and then the receiver will always give feedback that is when it is effective communication effective communication is when there is feedback and feedback is very crucial as we will see because it is through uh, feedback that we are able to tell uh, the senders that the message was well received and it was understood then again feedback will always make a communication process continuous and then uh, again, feedback will help us know if indeed the message got to the receiver on time because of the response they are go going to give us. And then every converse conversation will build on the feedback that we've got. And then again, we have noise, which is another element of communication, noise. And noise is any disturbance that makes communication not to be effective any hindrance, anything that will make whatever I'm talking to you right now, you don't get it. We can either have uh, technological noise in terms of technology because uh, today much of what we are doing is based on te technology in the uh, 21st century where technology is the in thing. So when I am, I'm talking to you, like when I'm calling you, at times you can have uh, disconnection, that is noise. Environmental noise, we live in places, we live in towns, in villages. There are constructions, there are cars hooting, there are people rioting. So that is another type of noise. Then we have physical noise, okay? There are times you will go to class and you're feeling you, 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 you're just tired. So what do you do? It is going to disrupt any communication that is being done. And then we have psychological in terms of mental uh, status. At times you're not okay, you're unwell, could be, you're disturbed by something. So what happens to you? Then you'll not be able to, co to concentrate. And another one is um, in terms of cultural noise. And this one I'll give an example with religion. At times we forget every religion has its own uh, rules, norms. And you could get someone talking about, uh, for instance, salvation to, a, to somebody who doesn't even believe in salvation. So to that person, that becomes noise. So like you can see, that is an, an illustration of the communication process where we have the sender encoding or coming up with the message, putting your thoughts together, and then you pass the message, the content you've come up with, uh, you pass it via a channel to the receiver who decodes and gives feedback. But in the process from this place to the, all the time we are getting the feedback, there's always noise, the disruption I've talked of. So to conclude that part, effective communication is a two-way process and it has key elements for success. 
So two-way process in that, we must always have feedback. That is now the effective communication. But it is not the only communication we have. And we know that communication is as a result of models and theories advanced by great scholars as Aristotle back in time. Uh, we will be discussing models and we'll be discussing theories, but we should not forget these are the people who have made us see communication the way as it is, who have made it uh, understand what communication entails and how communication takes place. So we do introduction, the definitions of a theory. First we start with the theory. And a theory is a generalized a statement aimed at explaining a phenomenon. So, in very simple terms, theories are set of ideas. We go to places and we hear people say, hey, Kamau has so many theories. I know back in the villages, that is the, even layman know, knows that there are theories, there are ideas, those so many ideas eh, that are used to explain something, a strange thing, something that we don't understand. I'll give a very good example. There's a time the world was supposed to end, in quotes, and people decided to go and dig graves, caves, and they sold everything, got into the caves, and they waited for the day to end. And apparently, the world didn't end. So to them, that was really bad. The group think it was really bad, and they wanted to kill themselves. So as a communicator then, I can think of these ideas. I want to understand. I come up with an idea. It is a group think. It's something that was done uh, by a, a whole group. And then I want to explain that strange thing, because it's strange. How do you say the world is ending, OK? And you dig these caves and sell everything, and you just go there, and then the next thing you want, if the world doesn't end, then you kill yourselves in that cave. Then that is so strange, because I'm thinking, even today, we in the, as we try to fight this COVID-19, the one thing we really want to do is to keep alive. So how you can just think of killing yourself, it's strange. So as a communicator, then, I can come up with a theory so that I can understand, an idea so that I can un understand what is happening in the minds of these people. Then a theory, as we have seen, because it is me coming up with the ideas, a theory is a construction. It is man-made. People sit down and think of things, and they s decide to test this thing. Is it true? Like the way people will think media is strong. Media is powerful. Okay, that is my thought. So I will sit down and study media and prove to you that media is strong. Another person will come in and say, no, media is not strong because human beings are active. That is my idea. Again, I will sit down and study this and give you reasons why I think that media is not uh, very strong. And then I'm a powerful. And then a theory is also an abstraction. A theory will prevent you seeing things in any other uh, dimension. For instance, I come as a media person and I tell you, we are going to study a theory, for instance, um, the magic bullet theory, which is a media theory that shows media is very powerful. So I tell you, media affects the way we do things, even the cognitive levels, what we have in our minds, we've learned from media. And I tell you, indeed, it's true. Because when I give an assignment, where do you turn to? Every day when we wake up, what is the first thing we interact with? It's the, our phones. That is media, okay? And then I will tell you, media will affect the way we behave. So those are my ideas. I will go to the field. I get a section of people. I study them. And I'll come and tell you, indeed, media is very powerful. And because I'll have convinced you the power of media, you will see things even when you go to the field based on the theory, my idea that media is powerful. Then, a communication theory is aimed at improving your understanding of the process of mass communication. So like when I come to you again and I use my same theory, the uh, magic bullet theory, and I've told you that communication, um, I mean media, is powerful, and information comes from the presenter to show the power of media, 
from the presenter through the medium to the people who are passive, who are waiting to get this information and they are affected. So what has that done? It has made you understand the process, the steps information takes before it reaches to you. So there's somebody who comes up with a message, the sender, the presenter. So my dear students, communication theory is aimed at improving your understanding of the mass communication process. So then what is mass communication? Because we've talked of theories and models of mass communication. We are defining terms. And mass communication is a means of disseminating information or message to a large anonymous and scattered heterogeneous mass of receivers who may be far uh, removed from message sources through the use of sophisticated equipment. In other words, communication is sending of message through mass. So a simple definition of what mass communication is. It is a process of sending information from the sender, the elements we've seen, to a receiver via a channel to uh, and this receiver, the target audience, we call them the target audience or the receivers, are one, anonymous. We do not know them. They are strangers to us. What we have between us and them is the parasocial uh, uh, relationship, whereby you feel like you've known that person for the longest time. When they call, you know them. You can be able to tell that is so-and-so calling. But in a real sense, we've never met. And then... They are scattered. These people are diverse. They are not located within one uh, geographical area. You'll find like your listeners are somewhere within uh, Ki Kiambu, Kitui, Mombasa, Narok, Nakuru. So these people are scattered and then they are heterogeneous. We don't even know anything about them. Their gender, who is uh, consuming our product. We don't know their religion. We don't even know their level of education. Okay, But we know that they are there listening. And the other thing that you need to realize is that every presenter, when they're presenting, they focus on that one uh, receiver. But in actual sense, it is not one, but there are many, many that we do not even know. And then, uh, even though now we have technology, and technology has come like a, 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 a sea between us, the presenters and the mass, we have the technology, the phones, all that we can be able to tell who the person communicating with us is. But still, we still send these messages via this platform. So the key thing of mass communication, the key three words is, one, the target audience is heterogeneous, is anonymous, and finally, they are scattered. Now we know what mass communication is. We know what a theory is. So now what is a model? A model is a purposive uh, representation of reality. It's a mental representation of how the world is. Every time, like for instance, if you wanted to buy a car, before you get to see the actual car, you will look at advertisements and see models of the car that you want to, the structure, the body of that car. If you wanted to construct a house, before you go and say, make up your mind, this is the house I need, you will see a structure of the house, the kind of a house you want. So what models do? They represent, they give us that representation in our mind so that we can be able to figure out to tell how something looks like in reality. The same way with communication. A model uh, is a systematic representation of an object. So this is our object. Communication is our object. So how is this communication process? So the model comes in and gives us a mental representation, a structure. And that is why, if you can remember this somewhere, we mentioned Aristotle when we were beginning. He came, he's the father of the models. He decided to study more about communication and public speaking because he was a public speaker. And he felt that in every occasion, there must be a, a, a speech, there must be the person who is going to read that speech, and the, there must be the audience. And then he came up with that, there's a speaker. So in our minds, we can see a speaker standing somewhere. And then this occasion, this occasion can either be a birthday party, 
It can be a wedding. It can be a funeral. It can be a graduation cer ceremony. Name them. There are so many. And then there is the audience, the people who are there. Like, for instance, we can assume in this our class, I am the speaker and you are my audience. And the occasion is where? It is in classroom. What is it all about? It's about study. So he felt that every occasion will have a different message. Even as a communicator, as a speaker, when you're coming up with these messages, make sure that you have the right content for the occasion. So we can even see in our minds. You can even see a speaker somewhere standing. You can even see that congregation. You can even see the message that is, you can hear, you can even imagine the message. If it's a birthday, then you know. If it's a funeral, then you know. And that is why we say uh, they, uh, they will help us understand the structure of complex events. For instance, again, I will use Aristotle. We know that when you go to do public speaking, because I know most of you will do a, a bit of speaking somewhere, when you're speaking to the mass, how you come up with these messages will have understood. So it will not be much of a hassle. We don't have to strain much to come up with this communication. So what is the importance of theories and models? One, communication theory will help you understand the technical aspects of communication. We are able to understand how information comes from the sender to the, uh, the, the platform, which is the channel, all the way to the receiver and how they're able to respond. For instance, if we can look at Shannon and Weaver, we will cover that later. These scholars felt that any communication doesn't have to be face to face. We can involve technology, and that is where they came up with uh, the illustration of a phone, a telephone a phone. We have a phone. We call our friends, and they respond, okay? So this is, we are able to understand now that bit. And then how this message comes from the sender all the way to the booster to, I don't know what, it's converted to zeros and ones, and then later back to the receiver. Then communication theory seeks to understand the different capacities uh, required for communication in order to develop channels that will successfully carry and deliver intended information. Now we have the content. We are able to tell this content suits print media or it suits uh, broadcast, television or TV, uh, radio. If it requires demonstration, we know we need to go to TV or could be internet. Again, if it requires uh, explanation, long explanation, then we know we'll go to print because print will give you enough space. Unlike radio where we only have mentions, time constraint is quite uh, present in radio. And then models is not, uh, to, the aim of a model is not to ignore complexity or explain it away but rather to give the order and coherence. So every time we think of models, my dear students, don't think of something so comple uh, complex. Because simply what, the what models are going to do and theories are going to do is to make your life easier so that you can be able to understand the process of communication, how communication takes place within, uh, could be from media to the society, from the society to people. Because remember, these people within the society They'll also be active because we said there are some scholars who will tell us people are also active people. So we can also be able to control the, the information we consume from media. And then they lead us to new discoveries. Let's go back to Aristotle. We've said we have an occasion. We've said we have the people, the audience, and we have the message. But then later, as we will see, other people came up with other models. And they felt like, yes... What Aristotle said was okay, but he missed out something. So this open area that he left is what we are going to study and tell. Communication, there's still something else that happens. There's feedback, you know, and so we are going to study. So they only make us be open-minded. We think outside the box, but they are not there to make us like we are glued there. We have to believe in everything that they have uh, communicated to us. And then they also help us trace out the history easily. Like, for instance, you will see Aristotle 
his theory will always, I mean, his model will always have a date. You'll come to another model, another theory, and every time you will be told who the scholar is and when the theory uh, was discussed by the person. So every time that we want a theory, if we wanted to know the power of media from 1970s, could be 35 to 1970s, we know the kind of theory or model that we can refer to. So then, how do you determine an authentic, original theory, a true theory, a good theory? One, the theoretical scope, that is how general is the theory. Then, the heuristic the uh, value. Some theories suggest that, uh, suggest ways in which further research may be conducted. Let me explain that one. Remember, these people came up with ideas which we are call calling theories. Now, these were their ideas. They could be biased or they could be neutral. We don't know. Because as we will see, every time we are looking at theories, we don't uh, argue about the truthfulness per se, but its application. How applicable is it? Because this person could have been biased. But can we still get something to apply? And everything, every time that you are coming up with a theory, you'll come up with the tenets, the key principles, and then what are the assumptions? And... Everything is, uh, you look at that, there's always a gap that is left, which we can fill. And this opens ways of further research. Then, the validity. It refers to the degree to which a theory is uh, accurate, uh, represents the truth state of the world. So that is what now, again, I've explained. And I've said, yes, a theory must have some truthfulness. Like when we say media is powerful, and Magic Bullet Theory has told us that media is powerful, okay? How powerful is this media? How true is it? If we did a survey, if we did a research on people who consume media, can we be able to come up with truth? Yes, you will. Because as you will see as we proceed, these people, even though you don't have content, I mean, uh, direct contact with media, Again, there is what we call the multipliers effect. So why do we discuss the same things, all of us in our country? Because of what we consume, the content we consume. So it must be valid, okay? Then parsimony, the law of parsimony dictates that a theory should provide the simplest possible viable explanation of a phenomenon. I said models and even theories, they're not there to complicate your life. And that is why in every theory, every model, you will have what we call the principles, the key principles. They will be like four or five. These four or five principles, they are supposed to help you understand the ideas between that theory. So a theory should not make your life miserable. You should be able to embrace and enjoy the process of communication in respect to the information, the knowledge that you've acquired via theories and models, then a theory should not exist to the absolute exclusion of other theories. Now, every time you look at a theory, because we'll discuss more in this uh, class, every time you're looking at theories, a theory will always have something that it agrees with another theory. And whether it is in terms of the elements, the process, you will use that theory and you can even use another one to second the theory you're using. Okay? So a theory should not exist to exclude. Like we say, uh, because, because a gender setting uh, theory is a theory of media that shows how powerful media is, then we can't read what Katz says, what the uses and gratification theory says, because we know and we believe that media is powerful. So human beings are never active, you know? We can do that, but we can use the knowledge we've got from the other theories, and then we can also buy from another theory, borrow from another theory, and then we combine the two. And that brings us to the end of our lesson. Thank you so much, my dear students, for turning, uh, for coming. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. 
You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.